Welcome to what hopefully is the conclusion of our brotherly kindness thing, uh, so that we can be done with it and don't have to be kind to each other. Oh, no, that's not right. Um, we are commanded to add some things to our faith. Uh, brotherly kindness is one of them, and uh, it comes just before you go to the capstone of agape. And in light of that, we get our priority. Our priority should be to love one another. That means other believers. Uh, in the early church context, it was those in the church because you didn't have relationships around the world. Um, you had the people that kind of lived in your same village. And Romans 12, uh, where they're living in a you know, capital of the world, Paul exhorts them to be kindly affectionate, uh, the stroge one, uh, to one another with brotherly love. Well, that's the Philadelphia over here. And in honor, we give preference to one another uh, we are basically have uh, such a relationship with God that we don't need to get honor from others and we can give it to others. Um, when we get honor from God, we'll see that a little bit later. Uh, therefore, we have it to share with others. Um, and then if you say you love God and don't have a good relationship with your brothers uh, and sisters uh, in the body, you're a liar. Um, because how can you love someone... Uh, who you can't see if you don't love someone who you can see. And it's a commandment. Uh, so we looked at some of the things that keep us from that, particularly bitterness. Basically, we get bitter at God because he doesn't do what we like. We get bitter at others because they don't do what we like. Or they've made us feel bad about ourselves. Um, so you need to renew your mind on that. There's some resources. We talked about it. Uh, then there's this kind of bit about doing uh, good to each other. Uh, beneficence is the, the, one of the uh, fruits of the spirit, and it's a you know something that you, you really have to mirror God's sacrificial love. He denied His right to be in heaven to come and bless us, um, doing what was in our best interest. We need to do the same thing, and uh, the cool thing that is is if we bless others, it's almost like a karma thing. We get blessed not necessarily by them, but by God. Um, okay, so we should mirror God's beneficence and love towards us in doing good to others. You know, it's funny, we'll accept God's blessings, um, but we don't want to pass them on to others, um, which is kind of really selfish. Oh, this thing, I'm going to come back to this. This is really cool. Well, I think it's cool. I was going to just do it in a vacation. But when Jesus says, take my yoke upon me, uh, on you, uh, and learn from me. Um, the verse that precedes that is you first have to come to him. He doesn't go chasing after people with a yoke. <laughs> uh, you, you basically have to make that decision to come to him, uh, submit to him, and submit to the yoke of Christ being put on you. And then all your other decisions are really easy um, because you know they're, they're, you're going to be linked with Christ and doing the things that Christ would want you to do and also keep you from doing stupid stuff as well, uh, which we are naturally prone to do. Okay. Uh, being fruitful, doing good to those who don't appreciate goodness. They don't appreciate God. They're not going to appreciate you. So you need Holy Spirit to help you help do that, um, which is going to be a requirement for holiness. Um, let's keep going. Our love should express itself in serving the needs of the saints. Dealt with that. Uh, basically, love is meeting needs. And uh, you say you love and don't have the actions behind it, you're deceiving yourself. And then uh, we covered the training objectives. I encourage you to basically go through them and master them. Uh, it's a lifetime. It'll, it'll take a lifetime to master them, but... Uh, well, it's going to take you some time to get it done. Uh, if you get to the point where you could be reproductive in a couple of years, otherwise you're reproducing stuff that isn't good. You can, you know, one day a old believer can share with someone how to accept Christ, but as to how to walk with Him, you got to be walking with Him to share with others how to walk with Him. All right, our love is hindered by lack of holiness. Last point. Um, Hebrews near the end of the book. It says, pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Whoa, do you mean if I don't pursue 
peace with all people, I won't see the Lord? No. A uh, little Greek grammar will help you see that holiness, I think, is uh, the feminine as is, I don't know, I the, new, the gender, but holiness and which are the same gender and peace is a different gender. So if you don't have holiness, you don't see the Lord. Really? Yeah, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Uh, this is a phrase that kind of gets drops out of the you know, Christian uh, teaching. But uh, it clearly is a thing that is evidenced all through the scripture. Uh, then as you're, uh, then it goes back to pursuing peace, looking carefully, being on guard, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. And as a result, a root of bitterness springs up. And a result of that, it causes trouble and many become defiled, which means disqualified from uh, worship. Whoa. So this little context here is no one's seen the Lord is, you know, the whole high priest was the only one to go and actually see uh, the Lord in the presence of, of the Holy of Holies. So the body has a responsibility, this is plural, to make sure no individual misses out on the grace of God. Now, the, some people, you could take this as the future grace of God, and it's possible. Uh, but the context is more of as something happens that could cause you to be bitter, God gives grace or power. And if you don't understand grace as power, uh, you'll totally miss this. To forgive them, to endure, to persevere, to be long-suffering. Um, and when things happen that we don't like, often not liking it is totally justified. You know, people do evil things. But getting bitter about it is not good because uh, that's going to cause trouble. And the major usages of this word for trouble are used of demons vexing people. Like the guy who was uh, possessed by a herd of um, a legion of demons. Uh, and as a result of this demonic uh, dissension, division, uh, dislike, uh, many in the body become divine defiled. And th this word for defiled was used in a secular context of dye. They're stained. Uh, and then the meaning is extended and used of people who um, are unfit for worship because they're unclean. And Titus talks about people whose mind and conscience are defiled, they're unfit for doing anything good. They, they can't think about what is good. They can't uh, have a sensitivity to the moral code of God. And as a result, they're you know just agents of Satan rather than agents of the Holy Spirit. So you, you need to basically pursue holiness to be able to have a body be holy. And we need to be watching out for each other so that people can draw upon the grace of God uh, Hebrews 4.12, uh, let's boldly throw, approach the throne of grace that we might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. And from, I think, much of Christianity, at least from you know, some of the contemporary sermons I skim through, uh, grace is, oh, that's okay. No, it's like, it's power, and they, they totally miss out on the power aspect of grace. Uh, Paul said in Second Thessalonians, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, uh, when God, he prayed three times for God to take away his thorn in the flesh, and God said, uh, you know, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Uh, so the answer is no, but I'll give you the grace to help. And then Paul says, okay, then I will glory in my infirmity. I will glory in this thing that causes me constant pain so that I may have a fuller experience of your grace. So the reason our love is hindered by lack of holiness is because our motives dealing with others will be impure and self impure and self-centered. Um, people will do nice things, so they'll be noticed. They'll do nice things, so others will do nice things back. Um, Jesus went about doing good because it was God's will. Uh, he, the notice that he got was for the most part um, opposition, <laughs> and the, what he got back was pain. And 
we are pretending we're other centered uh, but we're really doing it for ourselves, and our motives are going to be judged by God uh, one of the more clever tricks of Satan is to have him noise about the Christian community oh you can't judge motives well you don't really know what's going on in a person's heart but uh, eventually you it comes out um, and the, the motive for doing it like if they don't get appreciated then they stop doing it ah so what was their motive in doing what was good hmm to be appreciated and then they get bitter what we also do if we're not holy is we will hide from others so uh, there's a great book called Hide and Hurl. You know, it's a uh, drum of transparency. And it's got a picture of this wall between people in armor who are hiding from each other, just like Adam and Eve hid from God. And then they're throwing, you know, lobbing dirt bombs and rocks over the uh, wall to uh, hurl at others and blaming others. So uh, it was, you know, it's kind of almost comical with a guy says to Adam, did you eat the fruit I told you not to eat? The woman thou gavest me, she made me do it. And then the woman says, no, no, it was the demon, the Satan. He made me do it. So they're all pointing fingers. Uh, basically, I don't know what the poor snake did because you know, no fingers to point at anyone else. <laughs> but you can't get good relationships out of people who are hiding from each other. And the reason they're hiding is because they're trying to cover up the fact that I really don't like you. Uh, but I can't say that because I'm a Christian and I want to be perceived as being good. Um, and also what are motives that, that are impure will result in us using and damaging others. So I have in here compare, toil, CF means confer actually, but compare the toil relationship objectives. And I put this together at bad, better, best. Um, for the most part, uh, people's bad objective can be summed up in using others to meet my needs for whatever, companionship, significance, a good time, uh, to get resources. You, you just use them to boost your sense of worth and value because you're not getting it from God. And in the process of using others, you damage them. You take, but you do not give back. That, that's like totally unjust. And you'll, you know, unjust people get in trouble in the future. Um, you stunt their growth. It's like in codependent relationships. Uh, using others is what results from not having a holy relationship with God. If you have a holy relationship with God, then your needs are being met by him. And then you're free to meet the needs of others. I think if you go to James on Daily Truth Base, I'll, I talk about the royal law of liberty. So speak and so do who will be judged as those who will be judged by the royal law of liberty. And most people are clueless about what that means. Um, so you can go to Daily Truth Base and uh, take a look at some options uh, and realize, well, I'm going to be judged by this. I'm commanded to actually act in light of it. And I don't even know what it is. I remember giving that passage to preach on at a church and I went up there and preached on it and uh, incurred the wrath of all these people who didn't like what I said, but it was just what the scripture said. Um, okay, so holiness is important. You got to purify your motives. Um, and a great verse on this, most of you hear this, is uh, you know, if you conduct your life in fear during your time here on earth, and then it goes on to say, since you have purified your souls, who purifies your souls? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. How does that actually work? I don't know. We just sing it. Nothing, nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. <laughs> the blood of Jesus covers your sins and they forgive him. But the other stuff, if you say, in the, as the song does, it cleanses you. Okay, how does the blood of Jesus cleanse you? I don't know, but nothing but the blood. <laughs> um, I've asked, you know, I used to ask people, and I stopped doing it because of you know, aggravating them needlessly. Um, you know, it's like the blood's a metaphor for Christ's death. If some people get that far. Okay, so what, what does that mean? And it's basically, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us. But how does he cleanse us? Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, what does the scripture say? Uh, Jesus in his high priestly prayer, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify holy. How about this one? You purify your souls by obeying the truth. 
Ooh, here's a thought. Yeah, we should consider that. Uh, but my soul was already, uh, the blood cleansed it. No, no, no. Okay, soul is used in the scriptures for mind, will, and emotions. In Greek thought, that was the basic thing. And I, in the latter years, I've added the concept of values because that really is where your uh, thinking comes from. It's where your emotions come from. Uh, it's really having, you need God's values. You need Christ-like values. You need to value what God values. And uh, people don't know how to change their values. There's a sermon on it somewhere. But a simple thing is obey the truth. It's a lot easier to act your way into a feeling than feel your way into an action. So just do it. And you do it through the spirit. So that just knocks legalism out of the box. Um, the spirits at work in you to will and do God's good pleasure. How do you think that happens? As you're reading the scriptures, he will guide you to truth. That um, is something you need to apply. And then you need to ask him, how do you want me to apply this? That's where meditation comes in. You're thinking through the implications for applications. Uh, Joshua 1, 8, 9, and maybe even 10. Um, Daily Truth Base. <coughs> Look it up. It's revolving in your mind. Oh, it's worth quoting. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Okay, so it's a book of the law. But you shall meditate in it day and night. That was the first five books of the law. Um, so what are you doing with meditating? You're revolving it in your mind, looking at it from different angles. Towards what purpose? That you may be careful or observe to do according to all that's written in it. Did you get that? Observe to do. It's even better than that. Be careful, watchful, on your guard to observe to do. Take pains to observe to do what it says. God, where does this apply to my life? Is there any spot where you know, I'm not doing this? Is there any spot where I could do it more? That's how, and the Spirit will say, will guide you and say, uh, wait a minute, back up. You, you missed that important part. Or he'll say, uh, wait, there's more stuff coming. Or, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, search me, O God, try my heart, see if there are any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of life everlasting. Psalm 139. So, but you're doing this not so you can be all bright and shiny. Well, long term that will happen. But so that you now have a sincere love for the brethren. And once you have a sincere, without wax, not hypocritical, so statues, would get cracks in them and you'd fill them in with some wax paint, paint over them you take a little marble dust a little wax put it over the crack polish it over look well done um and then when you put it out in the light of the heat the thing would melt and the cracks would expose and you realize you had a flawed statue but unflawed love of the brethren who are we supposed to love again brethren i guess we could also do cithrin in there um love one another how fervently on fire zealously with a pure heart ooh, pure heart purify your soul and now you get a pure heart and you need to love one another out of a pure heart heart is a spot where the will made up its decisions and you're making good decisions i'll do this because it's in their best interest I guess you could almost say, I'll do this because it really annoys me and it's keeping us from a good relationship. Yeah, you could do it. Uh, I'll do this because I don't like it. No, that's wrong. Okay, there you just moved out of the pure heart thing. But, uh, you know, if you can identify this is keeping us from having a good relationship, then you can actually do the reprove, rebuke, exhort, all that kind of stuff that is kind of difficult. If you have a pure heart, your decisions and your motives are not for your ego enhancement ego your concept of self your self-worth so if i'm not supposed to do stuff for my self-worth enhancement like what am i supposed to do it for oh to please god um to obey his commands and get rewarded in the future um you don't need to enhance your ego because god is enhancing it when jesus obeyed we got baptism Voice came from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Man in his transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Uh, God basically was the one who enhanced Jesus's ego, not 
others. Um, and we will tend to do the right thing as long as we get our strokes for it. Why do people put so much time in at work? Because that's where they get the benefits. Uh, I used to weekly have breakfast with a trader on Wall Street who was an elder. He's now with the Lord. And uh, he said, you know, all the partners in his firm play golf on weekends so they don't have to be home with their wife and screaming brats. <laughs> <laughs> They'll work on Saturday and then play golf on Sunday, so I don't have to go to church either. Um, so, you know, we really crave uh, worth and value. God made us with that. Um, but just remember, Satan craved worth and value, and rather than getting it from being God's archangel, he wanted to be God. And we ran around wanting to be little gods. We want to be lords of our own life. And uh, I, do I need to say that's demonic sin? Yeah, I think I do. Yeah, that's not, not a good idea. Um, so you've got to purify yourself or you will wind up doing the wrong stuff, as you think. So you are. Um, oh, yeah, there's a little piece of the quote that I came across from some other thing. There's a guy who was a uh, famous scientist. I don't know why I was reading about him, but like, sometimes looking up someone who wrote something and like, find out and uh he nobel laureate and there was some article on how he became a scientist and uh two things were kind of neat he is uh he come home from school every day and his mother would you know listen to what he learned and it should always end with uh yes but did you ask any good questions today and it taught him to always be asking questions and then somewhere in that was this quote, uh, the eye cannot see what the mind does not know. All right, so for those who have trouble unraveling quotes, uh, in order to recognize something as a laptop, you need to know what a laptop is, right? So if you have do not have anything in your frame of reference for what it is, you don't see it. Let me bring that to Bible study. In order to know what a subject complement statement is, or to, or to look for it and see it, you need to know what one is. Uh, to know what a uh, subjunctive verb is, you need to know what that is. Uh, in the old days, you had to memorize you know, all this stuff. Uh, now you just click on a button that says, this is subjunctive. It means it might or might not happen when combined with ice. It is giving a purpose statement. It tells you the purpose for why you're being told to do something. So you've got to kind of basically, if I went into another country and they started talking about stuff and they mention a thing and to go find it and I have no idea what the thing is I'm never gonna see it I might be standing on it and I wouldn't know it because I, I don't know it so you need to spend time asking questions about what is that why is that there what does it mean uh, you have to be curious about your world you have to ans ask the questions that I can try to teach you to do in uh, how to study the Bible like Sherlock Holmes who what when where how why and why not um, so basically to um, be able to, uh, you have to know what the stuff is in order to look for it. All right. So if we walk in the light, as he in the, is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another. Um, and in that, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. We say we have no sin, we're a liar, and then if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. God is very anxious to have us agree that what we do, which is wrong, is wrong, so he can cleanse us from it. You can't confess or agree with God that it's wrong if you don't see it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then he can cleanse you from it, and then you're really unfit for fellowship. And what we've done is we've redefined fellowship. You know, the joke is it's coffee and donuts because that's what fellowship hall and that's what they serve there. So that must be what fellowship is. Um, it's really to have in common. And the thing that we have in common is Christ in the light. We have to walk in the light in order to have fellowship with someone else who's walking in the light. If the other person is not walking in the light, as it says in the Old Testament, can two walk together unless they're agreed? No, you can't. So, you know, I was having this conversation with someone who uh, is way in the dark and, uh, he talks about, well, let's just agree to disagree. And I said, I have a problem with that. Um, agreeing to disagree is great in stuff that is, you know, insignificant or opinions or preferences. 
Uh, but when it comes to stuff that's going to, you know, make eternal differences in people's lives, uh, I think we need to, you know, push to a conclusion. Um, and, you know, if you don't walk in the light, you don't have fellowship with God either. Uh, read the first part of First John on top of that. If you don't have fellowship with God, you're not going to have fellowship with others. And when you see people out of fellowship with others, you can pretty well be sure that they are out of fellowship with God. Unless you're like Martin Luther. Um, and the whole world is against you or Athanasius. Okay, he who says he's in the light, says the next chapter, and doesn't want a relationship with his brother. Is in darkness even until now. If you love your brother, you remain and abide in the light, and there's no cause of offense or stumbling in that person. To reiterate, he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness, does not know where he's going, because the darkness, i.e. Satan, has blinded his eyes. Um, yeah, most people are in the dark. So one of my favorite uh, easy allegories from Plato to talk about in Western Civ was the allegory of the cave. And if you haven't you can look it up, it's probably on Wikipedia, you can get the gist of it, but it, it's basically a description of a group of people uh, in the dark, and there's a bridge behind them, and there's a you know, fire on that bridge, and then uh, the fire projects shadows on the wall in front of these people that are facing a wall of stone. They can't even look at the fire. And then you know, servants carry objects over this bridge in front of the fire, and then it projects the shadow on the wall. I don't know if you ever do these things where you get birds or you know, do bunny rabbits. I can't used to know how to do those. <laughs> Shadowgrams. Um, and they spent all their time arguing about what the shape was by looking at the shadow. They didn't see the shadow. You know, they didn't see the, they're, they're deep in the cave. They're deep in the darkness. And th that's what they spend their time doing, this purposeless, meaningless task. Plato kind of described himself as someone who went beyond the bridge, beyond the fire, out of the cave into the blinding light and saw things as they really are. And then he tries to come back into the cave to tell people about it, what the real shape is. But when you walk from really bright light into dark, you, you don't see that, you know, it takes a while for your eye to adjust. So he wasn't that good anymore about identifying what these shapes were. He's saying, no, it's really this. And of course they you know, thought he was talking nonsense because clearly it's this shadowy thing that looks like a bunny rabbit with a bird. Um, and you know, Plato had seen the real stuff. Um, Plato had incredible insights. He did not get all his stuff from reason. In fact, he says, if you guys go getting a little too Western Civ here on you, but uh, in Crito, if you want to read that, that Socrates said it was revealed to him that he wasn't going to die. Plato believed in ideal forms, like we see a circle, and we try to draw our circles, but there's a perfect circle somewhere up above. And he says, what we have here on Earth is just a uh, reflection and an imperfect reflection of what actually exists up above Earth. And then he said it was other intermediary beings that kind of revealed that stuff to us. It's kind of really interesting how uh, in that culture, uh, they had this concept of a divine revelation. Not everybody went into it. All right, back to the scriptures. Um, next chapter. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Oh, okay, so there are people who are basically in the image of God and actions of God, and there are people who are the image and action of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Hmm, okay, this, 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 let's see if this is too tough to figure out. If they're not of God, then what are they of? Well, gee, the first half of that verse gave us two options. And if we knock out children of God, what we're left with is children of the devil. Bingo! <laughs> if you're not practicing doing what's right in God's sight, you're not a God. You're, you're doing the devil's will, not God's will. Nor is he or she who does not love his brother or sister. This is the message that you've heard from the beginning. So this is what was taught in the apostolic age. We should love one another. Not be like Cain, who was of the devil, of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? 
because he was jealous, because his worth and value got undermined by the fact that his brother's sacrifice was accepted and his wasn't. Okay, I'm going to come back to this one in a minute, but Genesis 4, chapter 1, as he's contemplating killing his brother because his sacrifice has been rejected and his brother made him feel bad, God said, dude, if you want to be accepted, do what's right. What's so hard about that? And I maintain that that is the marching orders for people that no longer live in the Garden of Eden. If you want to be accepted by God, do what's right. Otherwise, you're not accepted. God does not, ex says like, your sacrifices, I don't accept them. Uh, Jesus says, away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. People think that God unconditionally accepts people. He does not unconditionally accept people. That's one of Satan's lies. He unconditionally loves people. But if you are misbehaving, the scriptures indicate he doesn't accept you. You can be casting out demons in his name. And he says, uh-uh, no go. So his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. And uh, I, I kind of, it's pretty late in life when I kind of realized that there's this thing called jealousy and it actually affects people. Um, let's say, uh, I might have understood envy, you know, when I have more toys than, or as many toys as everybody else has or more. Uh, but jealousy, uh, but then I realized that drives so many people because they really don't have a sense of worth and value from who they are and uh, what they do. And then people say, well, Bill, you're supposed to have worth and value because you're made in God's image. Well, yeah, everyone's made in God's image. That does not give me intrinsic <laughs> worth and value. <laughs> um, like the people that become crispy critters in the future, i.e. in the lake of fire, were made in God's image. They don't look really valuable there, if you ask me. Um, maybe God likes crispy critters for his, I, I don't know. Um, no, he doesn't like them. So don't marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know we have passed from death to life because Jesus died for our sins. Will that be true in John 5, 24? And God said it, and I believe it, that settles it. However, here it says, we pass from the realm of death into the realm of life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother is still in the dark, is still in death, isn't living the abundant life that Jesus came to give. Most people don't get to these little letters in the back. Okay, so um, the reason you need holiness. Oh, any questions on that stuff? So, um, yeah. You mentioned at the very beginning about when you are not holy, you're using other people, and then in the process, you damage your relationship. And also you mentioned about that I don't like you, but Christians don't say that. Is it okay to not like someone as a Christian? Yeah, okay. So is it okay to not like someone as a Christian? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like is based on commonalities, uh, like I don't like the same movie someone likes. Uh, you know, the, the person is kind of abrasive. I really don't like them. I don't enjoy being with them. But that doesn't mean I don't love them and seek to do what is in their best interest. So Jesus did not like the Pharisees, all right? Totally not. <laughs> um, but he still debated with them, dialogued with them, uh, even denounced them as the Lord of love and infinite love, because he doesn't want them to have uh, the faith that awaits them because they are violating what God said. So yeah, it, it's, it, it's okay to like some more than others, unless you're a parent, uh, you have to kind of try to like them all equally. That causes so many problems when parents favor can one I kid. Okay. Sure, go ahead. Um, can a focus on your dislike of somebody cause bitterness? Can focus on your dislike. Yeah, so when you focus on your dislike, uh, Gothard was really good about this, uh, about how bitterness arises. Uh, he gives the example of the kid who hated his father and then just wound up becoming just like his father. Because when you focus on the dislike, what fills your brain and mind? The dislike of this person. And that's going to affect your actions that you don't like them and don't want anything to do with them. Uh, if you focus on the things that are, they're doing that, that are harming themselves in the relationship, then that should motivate you to deal with it. Otherwise, bitterness will arise. You do what you focus on. So, yeah, like focusing on your dislike is, you know, I think one of, one of Satan's strategies. 
Um, probably in the Ephesian church, there was a lot of that. I dislike you because you like somebody else. You know, you're, you're that group and I'm of this group. So, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it's a dangerous thing. So, uh, you know, you're, you have your preferences. Jesus had some preferences. Uh, who do you like more than others? Peter, James, and John. So we need holiness because a lack of it which results in our prideful self-will will prevent submissive, God-glorifying unity. So what's the big deal about unity? Why is it so important? Because God's glory is manifested in the church. I think that's Ephesians 2.20. Because we are the New Testament temple uh, built together of, by living stones in which God glory dwells. Is that First Peter 2, I think, something like that. Um, because that's the thing that God prayed for in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that is the thing that Satan seeks more than anything else to disrupt. If you can cause the opposing army to be disunified and not work together as a team, you will beat them. Any, you know, you just think of you know, a group of toddlers uh, or, you know, five-year-olds, we'll say, playing soccer against, you know, some college kids who know how to play soccer. Uh, it's not just because the college people are bigger and stronger and got skills. Uh, they play position. They, they have a, you know, they know where they're supposed to be and they are there. They don't just go running after the ball. <laughs> kind of, one of, if you ever watch little kids play soccer, it's both painful and funny. Uh, they, you know, the coaches are trying to get them to play position and they just, I want to go get the ball. Um, they, they just are controlled by, I, I, I want to be the star. Um, and as a result, they always lose. So unity is essential for God being glorified. And it's supposed to re our unity is supposed to reflect the unity of God, the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1, working together in unity for our benefit and to accomplish his purpose for this creation. Look at that last part when you next time you read um, Ephesians 1. Accomplish his purposes for our creation. That is actually what Ephesians 1 is all about. And then it's the book is all about unity. That's why he says in chapter 3, keep the unity of the Holy Spirit uh, in or by the bond of peace. Uh, basically recognizing that God had, nobody had any claim on God's uh, goodness. They were saved not because of their works, they were saved uh, in spite of their works. And uh, there's no one had, not, Jews and Gentiles did not have a claim on God. You can't understand the book of Ephesians unless you see the uh, clash between, actually most of Paul's epistles, the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, disparate people needed to be brought together in unity, and it's a sign that it is um, God at work. Uh, Can I ask a question? Sure. So how would this relate, for example, to someone like um, maybe G.K. Chesterton, or someone who's got a lot of great ideas, or sort of, let's say, Catholic versus Protestantism, where you have maybe one is very unified in terms of tradition, and another that's sort of a splintering fractal of truth in some sense. Okay, so it's there's the whole ecumenical movement. Um, there are some people that think it's an abomination. Uh, some people think that if you could get people talking and they'll be unified, it's actually gonna be impossible uh, to get people who's, uh, Oh, what's the best term for this? Their DNA, their spiritual DNA is opposite from the other spiritual DNA, unless they become new creatures. So you have uh, people in, in, you have people that have truth or pieces of truth in uh, most uh, of what is called Christianity. And I would even consider, like you find the golden rule and some other principles honoring your parents in um, almost every religion there is some stuff that's true but how do you actually get a relationship with God uh, what are you actually trusting in uh, when you get to the pearly gates um, and God says what should I do to actually he doesn't really say this but yeah. <laughs> what should I do to let you into my heaven uh, if you don't point to the fact that Jesus died for your sins 
uh, you're out of luck. So, uh, yeah, you'll have people that, you know, are bright. Um, they are articulate defenders of their thing. But when you actually get down to the uh, sola scriptura or what does the truth say, that resolves things and is the basis of unity. And if people aren't, you cannot have unity unless it's on the truth. Uh, you can have, you know, friendships, but it, that's not biblical fellowship because you do not have the same truth in common. And even if you say, well, a different perspective of how you're looking at the truth, uh, I have always said, uh, even as a very young believer, if godly people disagree, at least one of them is wrong, if not both. You know, you, you can't, you know, oh, he's a godly person, so what he says must be right. Uh, no, if it's what he's saying is accord with the scriptures, he's right. Otherwise, he's wrong. And, yeah. okay, any, any follow-up to that yeah. one? Yeah, I mean, that seems clear, but... But then let's say, like, let's say G.K. Chesterton shows up on the Zoom chat. Would you say he's someone that we have fellowship with in unity or like someone who seems to have, for example, I would agree with much of what he says, but not all. Where would that? All right. Well, we let unbelievers come does. in on our Zoom chat. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone's welcome. So let's define fellowship, have in common. We'd have some things in common. Uh, are we walking in the light? Uh, you know, there's lots of people who are moral. Unbelievers can be more moral than unbelievers. Unbelievers are, I mean, than believers. I get that right? So the people who don't know Christ can be even better examples of, you know, humility, self-sacrifice, giving, you know, all, all kinds of stuff like that. But do we really have Jesus, according to the scriptures, in common, when you realize Jesus is the word and the word that became flesh, we don't have yeah. all of Jesus in common. We don't. Yeah. Yeah, so there's going to be a difference. Uh, right. And then do you ask to what point do you have fellowship uh, as in terms of uh, you, you don't have real fellowship. You don't have biblical fellowship. In, in what sense do we have a relationship? Um, I've got some relationships with Jewish rabbis that are totally liberal. <laughs> I met this guy and I said, I mean, you really don't believe in anything that the Old Testament or New Testament says? And he says, no. <laughs> I said, well, where do you get what you believe? Oh, well, yeah, I just make it up. I think it, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, and this guy has a broadcast on peace. We actually have our good friends. Uh, he was a major TV producer and, uh, we, we've been at a number of events together and, you know, uh, I, we have some common ground, but uh, he's doing the devil's work. Um, keeping people out of uh, saving your relationship with Jesus Christ is the devil's work. And then keeping people who have a relationship with Jesus Christ from being unified is also the devil's work. Right. So, so first, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So just for that example seems pretty clear, but for someone like, let's say, C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, someone where I'd say like, oh, I think it seems to me that 90% or 95% of what they're saying lines up with what I believe the scriptures to say. Um, where would, where does that fall? Well, we're going to look at 1 yeah. Corinthians 1.10 in a minute where it says, be perfectly united in the same mind and same judgment. So where does yeah. it that, the fall? I'd look at what they are doing and seeing if I could support it. Like when I teach about Catholicism and Western Civ, I'm all for it. They kind of preserve civilization. Uh, they did much that was good. And I don't want uh, my students to throw out all of Christianity because Catholicism has a number of things that are really abhorrent to the scripture. I mean, like I, I give them a whole page of quotes that were divinely inspired by the Pope. And then I give them a page past the scripture and say, hey, match these up. <laughs> and uh, eventually they realize, oh, they don't match. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's like if people are moving to where there's a creator and we are accountable to him and Jesus is God, I think there'd be agreement there uh, as to what you have to do to get to heaven. Uh, if you ask people in some groups like the reform group, uh, it's because I'm chosen. So why do you have faith that you're chosen? Uh, because uh, I do good works. That's no different from if you ask a Catholic, uh, why are you going to heaven? Because uh, I, go, I go to a Catholic church and I do good works. Uh, neither of those answers are really going to hack it. Um, and I look at what the teaching is, yeah, being nicer people, 
uh, that's good for the world. It's better to live in a world that has Christian-y values than not. But I'm not going to, you know, basically be bonded together with someone who on this most significant issue is off the scripture. I remember I, I had a dinner once with F.F. F. Bruce and uh, I, I read a, he wrote a great book or the New Testament doc, uh, documents reliable. And at that point, I hadn't read a lot of his stuff. Uh, uh, but, you know, we we chatted. It was yeah, a good time. Um, and then I came across his view in Galatians that uh, there's neither male nor female, uh, slave or free, Greek or barbarian, we're all one in Christ. And he said, that is the marching orders for the church. And I, no, that's not the marching orders for the church. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm all for the rights of women. Uh, I'm all for the rights of women to be right. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, it's like F.F. Uh, F. Bruce and I would not fit in the same, you know, assembly together uh, because we wouldn't be of like-mindedness about what the truth says. Well, let, let's make do with this again when we get to uh, 1 Corinthians 10. Perfectly united in the same mind and same judgment. Can you just, just define what it means to be significantly bonded to someone? Like, what, what do you mean by that? Um, I would give my life and reputation for them, um, well, and they would for me. Um, I would defend them. I, and in fact, I would defend them against anyone who uh, would attack them and they're, if what they're attacking is truth. Mm -hmm. um, I would not I'm sorry, what did you just define? What, was the question? what does it mean to be significantly bonded? Was that the term I used? Yeah. Yeah. Said yeah, it's like bonding together in the same mind and same judgment, perfectly united. Yeah, you know, it's like uh, we are seeing the same truth, believing the same truth, and acting on the same truth. Um, that's what biblical unity. You just have to look at the uh, what the instructions are to the church on unity, for grounds for fellowship, biblical fellowship, friendship. You know. Uh, cordial cordiality, uh, helping each other out, yeah, all that stuff is good. But uh, I, you know, we're we going to agree to disagree on how you get your sins forgiven. That's a, or like who Jesus is. Uh, you know, that, that's a little tough thing. I, you know, probably would be a little closer aligned with, um, nah, be, yeah, in terms of application. Uh, Church of God, the disciples of Christ, they are really big and good on application. They're really bad on baptismal regeneration. All right, but you know, it's like you also have to get baptized. So uh, that you know, uh, I don't know. I haven't had the opportunity to really make have to make that decision, but I would support them in preaching that Jesus died for your sins, uh, that you're supposed to obey Jesus. And if they have this, you know, they definitely would you know, not have how you get dunked or not, uh, uh, something that would cause a separation of fellowship. Uh, someone who says you have to do this as well. Okay, I kind of see how much it affects uh, our ability to work together. Um, because, you know, I want to see uh, Christ proclaimed um, and people accept him. So they're doing that. Now they're also saying, oh, you got to do this and you got to join our church. Well, you know, then eh, it's, it's, uh, we're not going to be on the same page. All right, that doesn't mean you're my enemy. It's just that you're, you're not someone I can say I, I agree with you. Okay, so uh, as I was talking with some folks about this, uh, one of the things that came up was uh, she remind people that feelings are not truth. And I, I see this so much in the years of that I dialogue with folks. Uh, and it gets them into so much trouble when they get a feeling and they think it's truth. Okay, you have a feeling. Feelings are not divine. You can explain where feelings come from. I, I can trace them like I did in the uh, perception and performance thing. Uh, you get your feelings from a set of values based on your experiences, based on your family, uh, based on how you didn't see things clearly in your experiences and your family tradition is not profiting you. Jesus said, in vain do they worship me. In other words, their worship doesn't you know, get them blessing because they teach us the commands of God, which is truth, the traditions of men. Right? That's what Jesus' words, right? So, yeah, I, I believe him. 
So our prideful self will prevent submissive God glorifying unity. I had a guy who uh, said I, I could he could never be an elder because he believes in um, the extinguishing of the wicked that they're not in conscious torment. And I said, yeah, that's 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 no big deal. You know, it's like it's what's going to happen in the future to unbelievers. Like, why should that be something that prevents us from fellowship? It came out. He was sleeping with his secretary. So he found this nice little doctrinal thing to try to disagree with. And uh, now yeah, this was uh, not a good thing. OK, so wisdom from above is easily entreated, whatever that means. Um, but, but it alliterates, so it must be good. Um, so this passage from James is, uh, I misspelled the monarch, the monarch, you know, and I see, yeah, I think it's going to have an I in there, the monarch, okay. Oh, by the way, I sent out this outline with these notes on it. I sent it out a little late because I, the, the mom, oh, Nick, I need a Nick. Oh, you know, this is a junior order of demons. Okay, now we got the real ones. Okay, so, uh, James 3, if you have bitter envy, and this is the word for zeal, so remember, bitterness is bad, it defiles many, and uh, they the word for zeal is actually translated envy, because it's a burning desire, um, and you don't like someone, and you have self-seeking in your hearts. Philippians 2, 3 says, don't do that. Self-seeking is another cool word, uh, if you look this up, it's particularly applicable in light of our times, it would be people who uh, unlawfully uh, tried to get themselves elected to office back in ancient Greece. They stole elections. They would bribe people. Uh, I, I heard that they do this in India all the time. They just drive a liquor truck into the town and say, vote for this people, we'll give you liquor. And you know, the women were bore the brunt of uh, what happened to guys when they got drunk. We were all protesting about this happening. So it goes on in every culture, even our own. But they're really seeking uh, the advancement of themselves over others by nefarious means. Um, so self-seeking is demonic. That's what Satan did. Okay. Do not boast, you know, be proud of it and lie against the truth. So people pervert the truth um, to kind of get what they want and saying it's they're, you know, biblical or wise in the process. This kind of wisdom does not descend from above. It doesn't come from God. It comes from the pit. It's earthly, sensual, and demonic. So what was Satan's downfall? You go back. Uh, oh, I said, I can't remember where these two are. Uh, one's chapter 18. Maybe I, sorry, Ezekiel, no one's 36. Uh, it's the I will passages. I will ascend to the most high. I mean, the, I, will, I will be like the many. I will, I will, I will. There are five of them in there. <laughs> and it's basically Satan exerting his will rather than submitting his will to God. He was the highest created being. Why couldn't he be happy with that? You're the richest man in the world. Why can't you be happy with that? But you always have to seek more because it doesn't satisfy. What would have satisfied Satan is if he had submitted to God and worked on God's will and he would have been lived happily ever after and as would we have. But then they probably wouldn't have been on earth. Uh, sensual. Okay, so this doesn't mean, uh, you know, wearing something scanty. It's the, based on the senses. It comes from the earth. It has no spiritual component. It's only what you can taste, touch, see, and feel. I had this guy that I was uh, dialoguing with, and uh, he was strenuously accept, uh, rejecting the fact that um, I viewed the world as linear, like making progress. He says, no, it's a big circle. And he says, you, know, you, you you can't prove that. And I did refrain from saying, well, how, how do you know it's circular? I actually have a better argument for it being linear because I can see where things came from and where they are headed. And I can see it's, I'm not seeing the circle go all the way around. In order for you to say that things are, you believe in reincarnation, mm. wants to come back as a dolphin because of what <laughs> they spend most of their time doing. I'll let you look that up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and that's actually a regression rather than progression. But in order to basically say, assert that there's reincarnation and stuff, you have to be able to see the whole picture. 
uh, which you couldn't see. If we draw our conclusions from what we can see, then you'd say it's linear. But even that is not adequate. The only way a finite being can know infinite truth is if an infinite being reveals it to us. And is there any evidence for a supernatural being who can walk and talk? I actually could not get that statement out in three hours. It was amazing, the opposition that was going on there. So wisdom from above does not descend from above. I mean, this kind of wisdom that's self-seeking is demonic. It's Satan inciting people. Uh, why did the Pharisees get so bent out of shape over John the Baptist and Jesus? Because they're getting more followers than we have. Kill them. They're making us look insignificant. Why do brawls break out at British football games or soccer games? Like, it's that partisan spirit that arises because you don't have any worth and value from being rightly related to God, so you have to get it from a group. So Liverpool is better than Crystal Palace. You know, they, they fight. It's like, <laughs> why, why do you do that? It's like unbelievable. Um, so I would tell my Western school classes, you know, the whole idea of a fan of one team over another, uh, if it's going to lead to the breaking or rupturing of relationships, it's like, you know, you're dealing with people who don't have any sense of worth and value on their own. They have done nothing that, um, you know, basically merits God's approval. And then I have the people who say, you, you can't do anything meritorious. Uh, like suffering for doing good, the scriptures clearly say that is meritorious in God's sight. But, you know, it's like people are so ignorant of the truth. It's mind boggling. And I'm talking about religious people. Um, where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Okay, envy, envy, self-seeking self-seeking little chiastic structure what's in the middle the devil uh what's the result confusion disorder um i looked this one up it was i had a great definition but i'm forgetting what it is oh, i'm getting old uh and every evil thing are there god is not the author of confusion but of order so satan comes in and does that uh as I was looking up self-seeking, I came across its reference in the Second Corinthians 12, 19. Paul basically says, hey, hey guys, I do all things for your edification to build you up. And I fear that when I come there, you're not going to be as you should be. There will be bad things. And this is like this. He wrote First Corinthians. I think he wrote another letter. Then he wrote Second Corinthians. He might have written the fourth one after. I can't remember the exact order. But these are things that shouldn't be in a body of believers. Contentions. You're contending for one view or preference over another. Jealousies. Yeah, we don't like to admit jealousies because we know that's a you know a bad word. But really, we are jealous. When I see some people doing some really stupid things that are so contrary to uh, you know what I know about their past relationship, but <laughs> they're just jealous. Uh, they are getting worth and value from what they have. They don't like the fact that someone else has it. And they want to undermine them. Outburst of wrath. Where, where does that come from? This is what goes on in a church. Yeah, it does. <coughs> Gesundheit. Selfish ambitions. Yeah, there's our self-seeking thing. Yeah, you want to look better than someone else. You want to put someone else down so you feel better about yourself. That is a bad relationship objective. You're using someone to boost your worth and value by making you're them look inferior to you backbitings this is where you, you know, <laughs> stab someone in the back you know, through teeth so you use your teeth when they're not around to destroy them spread rumors whisperings i think that's kind of a similar thing conceits that's a proper view of yourself tumults that's fighting usually with lance and stuff like that so these are the things that go on in a church, and Paul, even though he instructed them, these are things that are really deeply seated, and unless people change their values and their minds and the way they think about these things, they're going to continue to be there. So I'll end with, time flies when I'm having fun, um, the wisdom that is from above. So that was the wisdom that was from below. The wisdom that comes from God is first pure. It doesn't have any hidden agenda self-aggrandizing motives and then it's peaceable 
I'll, I'll do these words again next week. Um, it's going to lead to harmony. Uh, gentle, there's a, oh man, I can't forget the meaning of gentle. There's a, there's a good little word there. Um, but it's, oh, uh, I think it comes into, yeah, one of the definitions for gentle is submissive, and one of the definitions for willing to yield is also submissive. So there are two words in the same group. Uh, it's not going to force its will on others. It's willing to yield. Uh, you're not going to yield on truth. Um, you might yield on a battle so you don't lose the war. Uh, there's lots of things in military history where uh, people, field commanders or generals, uh, you know, haven't wanted to admit defeat and they wind up having, you know, their whole group wiped out. Um, full of mercy and good fruits. Uh, mercy, remember, is not just uh, being nice to people. It actually is the... Uh, uh, Greek translation of the Hebrew Hesed. Um, it's fulfilling your covenantal obligations to others. Uh, it, good fruits. It doesn't have partiality. It's without hypocrisy. This is wearing a mask. What you see is what you get. So you're not hiding behind a mask of, oh, hi, everything's fine. You know, it's like, you know, when, when in the meantime, you're thinking, Rrr. um, yeah, that probably doesn't translate well into words. But um, now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So you can look at, you know, what's the fruit? Are people uh, becoming more Christ-like as a result of the relationship? Are they growing in love and unity? Or are they um, some more distance being sown? Uh, if you really have, you know, uh, people should be closer after an encounter over the truth rather than further apart if they are closer then that's the fruit of what's right in god's sight uh if they are further apart it's not okay my time is up i don't know how much more i've got in here oh okay just have one more line great i'll do it and then i'll be done hallelujah we need to see things from god's perspective wait no it isn't i got more down here all right yeah <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, sorry, we'll have to have a part six, but we're having such fun. Part six. Oh, this this is part six. Oh, seven is a you know number of perfection. It's a godly number. We'll definitely end it next time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that you are the all-wise God and that you give wisdom liberally to those who ask it of you and believe it and trust that you will provide it for them. And we know you'd want to give us wisdom so we can live in the unity and harmony that you desire. Uh, we know that you gave us your spirit to work in us to will and to do your good pleasure to create that unity and harmony. We also know, particularly from Ephesians, that Satan is working against that overtime, uh, that he is actively sowing discord among the brethren, uh, that he would like nothing better to see the people uh, you know, get defiled by bitterness and disqualified from worshiping you and cut off from your future blessings and glory. So, Lord, we pray that you would bind him and his influence on our body. Uh, we pray that you would cause your spirit to reign in us, uh, that we would be filled with your fruits, the capstone of which is submitting to one another in the fear of God, and uh, that you would uh, cause us to have the love for each other uh, that Christ had for us and that you desire. Uh, we pray that others would say, Behold how they love one another, and that the whole world would know uh, you through our love. Thanks for this time. Thanks for your truth. Uh, in Christ's name and for his glory we pray. Amen. Amen.